So the first case of significance that I had was the prosecution of Alphonse Persico for loan sharking charges. Um, and uh, he and his uh, driver, made guy named Michael Bellino, uh, they um, uh, gave what seems like a small amount of money, but at the time it was more significant than it is today, $10,000 to Cantalupo to put on the street for a, a guy who was manufacturing pocketbooks in the garment center in, uh, in Manhattan. Um, it turned out, sort of coincidentally, that when Alley Boy brought the pocketbook manufacturer the money, he uh, he didn't need it any longer, and um, Joey kept the money, but he still had to make the the weekly VIC payments to Alley Boy, and since he squandered the money very quickly, he was having trouble making the payments. Um, he's cobbled together money that kept Alley Boy and Michael Bellino, the, the collector, off his back for um, for several months. But ultimately, and while working with the FBI, um, he was recording conversations re regularly with Bellino. Uh, but when he wasn't making his payments, Bellino told him that Persico wanted him to come down to the Diplomat Social Club, which was the... Um, uh, the club or the bar from which Alley Boy ran the family's operations uh, in was in Park Slope in, in Brooklyn. Actually, it was just a few blocks from where I was living and where I still live. And um, uh, Alley Boy uh, met with with um, uh, Cantalupo, and uh, he wasn't wearing a wire when he went down there. He was too afraid to let the FBI know that he'd been summoned there, and uh, so he went down there on his own. And uh, Persico uh, smacked him around a bit and demanded his money back. Um, and uh, uh, we heard, he immediately told the FBI what had happened. And then we, 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 we were able to get him to wear a wire again. Um, and Bellino confirmed that the beating had taken place, that it was, it was in furtherance of the conspiracy. His statements were in furtherance of the conspiracy. So we had some corroboration for the fact that um, Ali Boy had beaten uh, Cantalupo. What gave the case a, a sort of a twist and made it more difficult to prosecute was that um, <clears throat> their defense was that Cantalupo had gone to the owner of a real estate uh, business in uh, in Brooklyn. Uh, Cantalupo worked for his father, who had a real estate business as well. But he Cantalupo had gone to a, a, a real estate um, a business in uh, uh, in Brooklyn, and he had arranged to have some punks throw uh, bricks or rocks into the windows of the real estate office. And he went to the owner, the proprietor of the business, and said, uh, look, you know, I'm with Alley Boy. Um, I'll we'll take care of this for you if you pay me some money. And he invoked the name of Alley Boy. Uh, Alley Boy, of course, knew nothing about it. And this guy, of course, had the impression that Alley Boy was somehow behind all this. Alley Boy found out about it, and Alley Boy was enraged. And so the real motive for take, getting the money back was because he wanted um, – uh, Persico. Uh, he wanted uh, Cantalupo to return the money. He, he wanted to punish him for using his name. He was lucky that's all that was going to happen to him. And when he smacked him around, the motive, you know, he, he had two motives because when he was smacking him, he was saying, you got to give me, you got to pay the money back by next week. Um, so therefore, there was an extortion or threat in connection with the demand to get the money back. But the real motive uh, and what made Cantalupo so despicable in the eyes of the jury would be the the fact that he was invoking Alley Boy's name without the right to do so. Um, so it was a fairly weak case. It, um, we tried the case. I tried the case um, in February of 1980. I remember the uh, the Winter Olympics were were on. Uh, the before Jack Weinstein, who moved the case very very quickly, and we we uh, we tried the case in about three days. Uh, the jury was out over the weekend, and when uh, the jurors came in on Monday morning to resume deliberations, one of the jurors reported to the judge that he had read a newspaper article about the case over the weekend and that he was hopelessly biased in favor of the government. There was an article that said that Alley Boy was the boss, the acting boss of the family. Um, <clears throat> It was probably our good fortune that that happened. It was stupid. I mean, in our mind, there was no question that the the 
the defendants that the Colombo family had gone to the Jura and somehow had gotten in touch with him and and um, and, and told him to make up the story that you know we, they were going to have to get they wanted to get a mistrial. When uh, Jerry Capisi, who was the noted crime writer at the time, he was the, He's the godfather, former. the godfather of of uh, crime journalists. We all pay homage to to Jerry. I wouldn't be here. Yeah. Without Jerry. Yeah, well, and so now we're talking you know, over 40 years ago, and Jerry yeah. was covering the case as a beat reporter. For, he was then working for the Post. He he later went uh, to the news, and um, uh, he interviewed the jurors afterwards, and the jurors were, at the time, they were about eight to four for acquittal. So if they continued to, if they had continued to deliberate, they could very well have um, uh, rendered a verdict of, of not guilty against Alley Boy. Um, so Weinstein was a, a legendary judge in, in, uh, in New York. He just died about two years ago. I think he was 98. He was hearing cases until he was 97, and he was still sharp as a tack. Um, he put the case on the calendar like a month and a half later, and I tried it a second time. I, I had a good sense of what all their defenses were going to be, and I was able to open up and sort of knock the wind out of their sails. And um, what made the uh, – and we got a conviction – the jury rendered a verdict convicting Alley Boy uh, rather quickly. Um, what made it um, somewhat exciting, uh, there were a few things that were exciting about it, but one, um, there was a commotion in the courtroom. I was examining probably Cantalupo or maybe, you know, I forget, the, maybe there was another witness. And I could see, I could hear there was this big commotion in the courtroom. When I turned around, I saw, I, I saw Carl My Purse go. In the, in the back of the courtroom. And I hadn't realized it, but he had just been released from prison and he came to the trial to you know, show his support for support his brother. For his baby brother. Or was it, yeah. it was his little brother? Or was it, no, his, it was his bigger brother? brother. It was his older his brother. Big brother, he, okay, was, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was, he was much bigger than him. And, and they, they looked nothing alike. I mean, Alley Boy was this big, tall guy with a full, strap, full head of hair and very handsome guy. He had spent 18 years in prison for a murder that um, he pleaded guilty to when he was 20 years old. Legend has it that it was Carmine Persico who who actually had committed the murder, and he took the rap for his brother. I'm in the minority and think that that's not true. It made no sense for an adult, a 20 year old, to take the rap for a a a, a, a minor. Um, if it was if it was Junior Persico who had take the rap for the for the murder or been convicted of the murder, he wouldn't have been facing the death penalty. Alley Boy was 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 facing the death penalty by getting implicated in the case. So most people disagree with me. They think he was Junior who did the killing when he was 15 or 16, but I disagree. But in any case, uh, Persico came into the courtroom. The spectators in the courtroom, many of them were interested in organized crime, and they thought it was, it was sort of like Mickey Mantle walking into the courtroom with Joe DiMaggio in New York. You know, it's, uh, it was a big deal. Um, and uh, so it was, you know, it was a satisfying experience. It was my first significant case out of the box. And, and uh, uh, I convicted the acting boss of the family. To watch the entire interview, become a member today by going to patreon.com forward slash original gangsters or simply click the link in the description.